Θέλω να παρακαλέσω θερμά να προχωρήσουμε στην επόμενη ενότητα στα θέματα της χρηματοδότηση των μεγάλων έργων υποδομής. Να παρακαλέσω θερμά τον κύριο Θανάση Έλλη, ο οποίος θα συντονίσει αυτή την ενότητα. Η κυρία Άντερμαν έπρεπε να φύγει για να πάει στην, στη Ρώμη. Πρέπει να πω ότι μεροληπτώ λίγο παρουσιάζοντας τον κύριο Έλλη, διότι τον παρακολουθώ πάρα, πάρα πολλά χρόνια από τα χρόνια του στις ΗΠΑ και στις συγγραφές του τώρα στην Καθημερινή, από τους πιο σημαντικούς Έλληνες δημοσιογράφους. Τον ευχαριστώ πάρα πολύ και για τη συμμετοχή του. Θανάση. Can I have Mr. Sakelaris, Mr. Patridge, Mr. Jalad come up? Okay, I will be very brief. Um, I guess we talk a lot about what we want to happen or might happen, but the question behind all of this, the planning and the decisions is the financing, if something is feasible um, and if there's interest for it. So I hope today's discussion will shed some light on these questions um, about the uh, projects in Greece, energy related, of course. Um, one of the questions I assume is, is there the necessary financing, <coughs> the financing resources inside Greece, the political will and economic will inside Greece, is there interest uh, from abroad for these investments? And also what's the perception for companies, banks and um, investors, uh, their perception about the political environment in Greece and the uh, economic environment in Greece that would allow them uh, to move ahead with a possible investment in a specific uh, area. And of course, one of the questions we deal a lot in Greece is the uh, bureaucracy we have, the way the government works, um, our tax system. So I guess these will be part of the, um, your, I might you know, think, your answers or your short introductions and then we'll take it from there. Now, um, we have, I don't know who would like to go first, we have Mr. Partridge, who is, uh, co-heads co the project uh, and structured finance department at Gazprom Bank and leads the bank's work uh, as a ranger and financial advisors of project and structured finance for major projects. Um, of course, the whole bio is here, but I'm not going to go into it. Uh, Dr. Saleh Jalad uh, holds the position of group vice president and consultant to Consolidated Constructors Company. And Mr. Puta Rosakelaris, who is a professor these days, but used to be the vice president of the um, European Investment Bank, and I assume knows a lot about investment in Greece, at least from the European perspective. Um, you go first. Thank you. Good morning. Check my notes. I will try this morning to um, to give you the perspective of a of a project finance banker. Do you think this is worth a billion dollars? This was a question that was asked. Uh, by the uh, then uh, CFO of uh, what uh, Qatar Petroleum or QGPC it was asked some 17 years ago as I was walking along the, the jetty of the new LNG port um, in, uh, in Ras Lafan in Qatar. Uh, that was the, uh, the beginning of a complete change for that country and for the gas industry. Uh, Qatar was about to start uh, liquefaction and export of LNG. Um, it uh, 
was then uh, a completely new step. It is a little bit hard to, to imagine today. We're so used to it. There is LNG cargoes going around the world, uh, countries buying, and uh, today the, uh, uh, the talk is more about the shale gas revolution and uh, uh, the uh, new type of contracts than the very idea. But back then, it was a big step. Back then, it was a huge bet, uh, close to $10 billion in all, because the billion dollar that we were talking about was just for the jetty, for just for the port. Um, and uh, Qatar didn't exactly have that kind of money, but they managed to somehow raise the financing for the project. So uh, the world has changed. Uh, very much in the past uh, 15, uh, 17 years. Um, Gazprom Bank uh, has uh, changed from what was then a small Gazprom Link Bank to uh, today one of the uh, top 10 European and project finance banks. Uh, we have been seeing all kinds of projects, and I will be trying to, uh, to see what makes some project work. Why can we finance some projects, and why is it difficult to finance others? What are the criteria um, that will apply to Greece, to the region, to uh, uh, any kind of uh, a project? Uh, what, what, what are the, the, the projects that, that get uh, financed? Uh, I think the first thing I would like to emphasize is that you need to, uh, to look at what the changes bring. Change brings opportunity. It brings also potentially uncertainty. Um, and how do you get from there to, to investment? How do you get it right? Uh, the first thing that I would like to emphasize is that for any project to work, for any project to get finance, you need to have a viable economic project. It sounds simple, but it is a basic uh, reality which very often gets forgotten. Sometimes the idea is, oh, we're going to, to build that pipeline that goes from here to there. We're going to do this. We have this great project. But it corresponds to more of a political idea. It will correspond to a, uh, uh, a principle uh, it corresponds to a dream. It does not necessarily correspond to a viable economic project. Uh, and to get there takes a lot of work, a lot of cooperation. Uh, but you need to start by having something that has good economics, something that makes sense from an economic perspective. Then there is the environment. Clearly, uh, there is quite a bit that governments can do. First, there are the questions of geopolitics. Uh, it helps that there are no disputes on the, uh, on the territorial rights of a project. Um, it helps that uh, you have a, uh, a legal uh, and regulatory environment uh, that uh, will make things clear, that make the, the rules of the game clear, and that you can expect to be stable for the length of the, of the project. Um, there have been, uh, back in um, 2005, 2006, there was a lot of turmoil in Russia about the Sakhalin Energy Project uh, because um, there were circumstances where there was a lot of uncertainty. Uh, the, there was not strong government backing for the plan of the, uh, of the sponsors. And there were many reasons for that. Some of the reasons were that the project cost had doubled, and because we were under production sharing agreement, that meant that the revenues to the state would be uh, delayed by some 10 or 15 years. Uh, that clearly was not very appealing, and the project lost a lot of political support in the country that does require uh, a lot of approvals, bureaucracy, uh, and uh, where you need a strong political support. That was restored through an agreement that uh, ensured that there was uh, a uh, special dividend that was going to be paid to the state under certain uh, stages of the development. Uh, the political support was restored, and the project is today a very successful LNG project. Of course, that was not the only factor. It was a strong project in itself. It has a strong economic logic of delivering gas to, uh, to Japan. But it serves as an example of making sure that you balance the different elements. Um, the, uh, 
you should try to avoid, of course, geopolitical interference. I sometimes am a little puzzled when I hear that there is an auction uh, to sell privatized companies, but then when uh, the, uh, the top bidders uh, are from uh, uh, Russia, there, is, uh, there are some, some people who say, oh, but maybe uh, we should uh, change the rules of the, of the auction. Uh, the rules need to be reasonably clear. Um, the, uh, you have to take into account the fact that uh, public opinion is going to have an impact on whether a project is feasible or not. A shale gas project is a good project in the U.S. It is a legal project in France. Um, and uh, you need to, to see how things are going to be evolving. Uh, once uh, Chevron told me that for them, the place with the most difficult political risk they ever had to deal with was not uh, Angola, it was not uh, countries in Asia, it was California because they had spent a lot of money on an offshore project in California and then the California legislature outlawed uh, offshore developments after they spent a billion dollars there. There was a problem of reading what was going to be the impact of public opinion. Uh, there is uh, the influence of the tax regime. Uh, sometimes the tax regime that is applicable to a project is going to mean life or death for a project. And uh, thinking very carefully, the balance between uh, the, uh, the, the public interest in maximizing tax revenue, but at the same time ensuring the viability of the project is uh, a very difficult task. It is not, it is not simple. Uh, to figure out what is the right balance, uh, what is going to ensure the viability of the project, and at the same time ensuring a proper distribution of uh, revenues. Um, the, uh, in the particular case of the EU, um, I think that the EU signals are also something that are very important. Uh, I work on many projects that, that uh, are linked to the EU, either because some of the sponsors are from the EU or because the projects are uh, going to clients in the EU or because uh, the, the projects are physically in the EU. Well, there has been a lot of uh, lack of clarity on some of the energy um, goals of the EU. And actually, I was very, very pleased to hear uh, from uh, Mr. Velez this morning that there was a response coming from the European Parliament because we shared some of the same concern about the fact that the goals seem to focus exclusively on some aspects of the policy and not maybe take fully into account the need for investment. So we are, we are heartened to hear that. Um, but ultimately, uh, risk is the name of the game. Everything will rely on how you deal with the distribution of the risks and how you mitigate those risks. Mitigating uh, the key risk is very important. Uh, there is the government risk. Uh, if you expect uh, that uh, you're going to have difficulties in dealing with the, with the, with the government on the project, whether you're talking of uh, authorizations or whether you're talking of the risk of nationalization in the future or whether you're talking of uh, the risk of government interference, uh, those are going to have an impact on the decision uh, to invest or not to invest. Uh, there is uh, construction risk. Is, uh, is the project feasible and uh, can it be, uh, uh, can it, can it be uh, Undertaken. In a country like Greece, there may be an archaeological risk. If you spend a lot of money and discover some, some treasure of archaeology, it's going to have an impact. So you need to be able to mitigate and, uh, and, and know how you're going to deal with that. Um, you have the contractual counterparty risk. Uh, you need to ensure that you have counterparties that are reliable, that you can count upon, that will be able to, to deliver. There's, of course, all the risk of uh, cost overruns and delays and you will want to make sure that you have something in place to handle this if uh, this uh, should, uh, should happen. Um, environmental risk. Uh, we are in an era where you cannot implement a project that will uh, have a negative impact on the environment. Uh, and it is very important to take that into account from day one. Many times we have seen situations where uh, sponsors have launched all kinds of plans, have started to do some work, 
only to realize later on that they're going to have a hard time to comply with environmental standards. But often it is too late afterwards because you, uh, you will not be able to raise financing. A lot of the, uh, the sources of funding these days are implementing, uh, for example, the uh, so-called accorded principles, uh, which require that you take into account environmental constraints from the, from the beginning. And it's very difficult to right or wrong in that, in that respect. Um, for projects uh, that are in local currency, there is the question of the currency risk. It can be uh, a bad idea to finance uh, in US dollars something that will have revenues in, uh, in, uh, in, in euros or in rubles. And uh, you, we have seen situations uh, where some projects uh, were financed in a currency because it was cheaper only to find out later on that uh, when there was a, uh, a devaluation, uh, it was difficult to match the revenues of the project with uh, the, the, reven the, the currency of the debt. Um, there are technology risks. We are li living in a, in a much more complicated world today in many sectors than we used to. Uh, dealing with shale gas implies using, uh, for example, new technologies, but also conventional gas can be more, more complicated. Uh, we are dealing in Russia with some of the projects that are now in the Arctic, so you need to, uh, to be able to transport the gas uh, in, uh, in circumstances where the sea is frozen all year and you can use the icebreakers going east only in the summer. Uh, so those are all aspects that need to be uh, into account. And all of those risks, the important thing is how to, uh, to, to, to mitigate them. There are many business models. Uh, some will work better than others. Uh, but uh, regardless of the business model in the end, what will be important is to allocate the risk to the party that can best uh, uh, understand the risk, who can best mitigate that risk, and uh, can bear that risk ultimately. Um, once you have done all that work, once you have a clear vision of uh, what will make your project economically viable, that you have a good understanding and you have reasonable certainty, uh, you can start to negotiate the financing. And you have to remember that on the financing, lenders are, uh, by definition, uh, receiving a, a limited uh, return. If everything goes well, they will receive a few percentage points. Uh, and that's the way it should be. But in return, they need to be able to take measurable risk. This is not an equity risk. So the, you need to structure the, uh, the project in such a way that those risks can be understood, can be measured, uh, it can be allocated. Uh, the uh, projects uh, can require today uh, significant sums. Uh, and it is best to look at what are the appropriate sources of funding. And today, this is uh, quite uh, diverse. Uh, there are situations where you can use uh, export credit agencies when you have uh, equipment that comes from different countries. Um, ECAs are useful not only to cover the risk, but also simply to diversify the funding sources. Uh, you can use multilaterals. Uh, such as uh, the, uh, the IFC, uh, you can, uh, or EIB, uh, and, and, and there again the key is what is uh, the goal of each of these institutions and whether the, your project is going to fit those, uh, those needs and those requirements. Uh, you have commercial banks, uh, you have capital markets, and of course how you deal with those different funding sources and what order needs to be carefully thought out and, uh, and uh, prepared uh, so that uh, you don't end up negotiating with uh, 27 different persons at the table, each with very different goals and objectives, and you get into an unmanageable process. So sometimes it is easier to start with a smaller group that you know will be trusted by the other ones, uh, such as working with ECAs before you start with the commercial banks. Uh, agree on a, on the structure and then sell that structure to the uh, to the other parties. So, by having those processes, uh, the uh, the practices that you see that uh, uh, those projects uh, have been historically financed, project finance in particular can be a very good source for infrastructure projects. 
to, uh, to lead to a, a proper allocation of the responsibilities of the risk and the, and the, and the funding. So uh, on this, um, I will thank you very much. And Dr. Gillette. Thank you very much. First of all, I would like to thank the organizers for uh, giving me the opportunity to uh, share my intellectual responsibility of 40 years of experience in oil, finance, and construction in less than seven minutes. So please bear with me. If I am very fast, we will talk after this session. Secondly, I am also the publisher of probably one of the most credible weekly publications in English language on oil and gas concentrating on the Middle East. It comes out every week from Cyprus. Now, what do we mean by infrastructure? Let me try this first. Could you help me, please? I, uh... oh. Infrastructure is best, can best achieve its socioeconomic uh, results if infrastructure is looked upon perceived, planned, and executed as an integrated system rather than its scattered system, rather than independent projects. So it's, this is a very important uh, uh, assumption because it can be efficiently, uh, it can achieve efficiently its, result, its aspired results. Infrastructure has an enormous impact on the GDP. If GDP, we can take GDP uh, uh, like everybody else, although it does not mean that it is the only measure, uh, that it measures the uh, uh, growth of the, co of the economy. You see in this chart that there has been a direct relationship between the per capita income of Greece with the GDP. In a great extent, probably it is because of the infrastructure inefficiency that is in this country. Because infrastructure, the stock of infrastructure in Greece is approximately 70% of the GDP. And what we require here in Greece is this better? What we require is an expenditure in, the, in uh, Greece of approximately five to seven billion dollars per year in order to sustain a normal growth in GDP in this country, in Greece, okay? These are facts. I may be wrong in the calculation, but not in the direction. You could see one of the most important issues and significant role that infrastructure projects play in the economy is in its employment effect. 
employment with all its uh, related um, uh, socioeconomic issues are directly affected by, affected by the expenditure on infrastructure. And this is a real gap up to date in Greece. So there are measures, yes, that has, must be taken. But in order to elevate the employment problem in Greece, which is very important, okay, is to spend more, immediate spending more on infrastructure projects. Why we are talking about infrastructure projects, really, is because infrastructure can affect almost every single thing, every single entity in society. It is extremely important for the stability and the growth of society and therefore, and therefore, for funding facilities. We are talking about funding. And we understand risk. We understand all kinds of risk, okay? For, let me give you an example, for instance. There is, according to my uh, researches, there's ample uh, uh, supply of available funding to various questions, uh, uh, internationally and nationally, for very good infrastructure projects worldwide. There are very good feasible projects. There's no shortage of projects in Greece not for sale to foreigners, but for your own benefit. However, why there is no matching between the appetite of long-term investors and long-term institutions for long-term projects in Greece? There must be a problem. Why should the funds go somewhere else? My, I want to be very short here, my uh, conclusion lies in governance. Governance is probably one of the most important issues that financial institutions look into carefully, but they don't talk about it, like many, things, like many other things. Maybe they don't know. Maybe this will be the issue like in Basel III that's coming. You will see about governance. Everybody is talking about governance, okay? Because yes, governance is very important and governance not, does not mean government. It means all through the system. If the system, but of course the maestro is the government, all right? If the system does not look at the governance issues at all stages, all right, then you will not find really, a, an, a, 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 you will have less opportunity to finance these huge projects, including oil and, and all those dreams will not be realized. We can talk about governance for a long time. Governance means means accountability, prompt accountability at every stage. Governance means transparency at every stage, whether in the authorities, in the private sector, or in the, in, in the public sector. Governance means banks and financial institutions should not follow the dictum, heads, banks, win, Tales public loose. Thank you. Thank you very much uh, to the organizers for inviting me here. I uh, I will try to uh, uh, concentrate. Uh, 
uh, maybe make it a little bit more general, concentrate on the European Union uh, and on total energy infrastructure and the financing needs of that, and then maybe uh, limit it a little bit to our uh, region uh, later on. So I, I start with uh, some facts that uh, I see from uh, the analysis that uh, uh, we have uh, received from uh, both the Commission and uh, the other EU bodies. And I see there that uh, the European Union needs for uh, financing energy infrastructure until uh, 2020 are about one trillion. Uh, so, uh, and these include uh, both uh, transmission, uh, uh, electricity transmission, gas and oil pipelines. It, in it includes uh, distribution later on. And then, of course, it includes uh, terminals and storage. So we're seeing that in the next uh, eight, nine years, there are huge needs for uh, investment in such energy infrastructure. These needs are a little bit more elevated than, uh, let's say, in a normal cycle, and that has to do with the, uh, both uh, the impact of uh, maintenance that needs to be done, but also the impact of the Agenda 2020, which... Uh, implies a uh, specific uh, intensity of, uh, of investment. Out of this uh, one trillion, uh, the, uh, the Commission uh, services estimate that about 210 billion euros are needed just for the uh, uh, sectors, for the uh, energy infrastructure that has to do with electricity transmission and uh, gas and oil uh, pipelines. Now, a lot of uh, the discussion in this uh, forum in the yesterday and today has concentrated on uh, gas and oil pipelines, but we shouldn't uh, forget that uh, a big part of uh, the energy security part, but also the uh, uh, achievement of the 2020 agenda goals uh, has to do with uh, electricity distribution, included in the uh, Helios project that uh, Mrs. Javella was uh, talking about earlier. So about 140 billion uh, euros are estimated for electricity transmission needs for investment uh, and 70 billion for gas and uh, oil uh, pipelines. Now, uh, these are uh, elevated needs. These are big needs uh, to, to begin with. We're talking about some projects uh, some of which are commercially viable, and uh, we, were, we heard earlier about what uh, makes a project commercially viable, but some of, some of these projects uh, have more of a public good uh, nature and are not commercially, commercially viable, uh, in which case, of course, uh, the uh, uh, contribution of the, uh, of the public and the state uh, financing is, uh, is important. And we are in, in the middle... Uh, of, uh, of a confluence of uh, problems, uh, many of which uh, have their source in the financial crisis that we have been living in the last uh, six uh, years. So the crisis basically uh, has led, uh, or some would say uh, has been uh, caused, uh, by certain limits in the ability of uh, government to expand their debt. We have... Uh, fiscal crisis, we have uh, found that uh, to a large extent the EU governments do not really have the capacity to invest in public goods or in public infrastructure as they used to in the past. And this is something that will last uh, at least for the next uh, decade. Uh, we'll see how much more. So one uh, conventional source of uh, financing, which is uh, public uh, financing, is severely constrained. Uh, the second thing that the crisis uh, has done is it, ha it has uh, created uh, uh, significant problems to the balance sheet of banks. Uh, banks, at least in the European uh, Union, have been traditionally a very uh, big source of uh, financing for such large uh, infrastructure uh, projects. As a result of, uh, of the crisis, these banks are not, and because of the, the, the state of their balance sheets, are not in the condition... Uh, to continue uh, that financing that uh, they would be, let's say, uh, a decade ago. And then, uh, partly because of the crisis, but also partly because of a process of, uh, of uh, banking and financial system regulation that had started even before the crisis, uh, we have the, uh, the onset uh, in a few years 
uh, of uh, new regulation, in particular Basel III for banks and Solvency II for uh, insurance uh, institutions, which are at least estimated to restrict even further the ability of uh, uh, universally uh, banks, but specifically also for the uh, European Union banks, to be able to participate uh, in this uh, financing. So, as a result, uh, what we are left with uh, is uh, a large gap uh, in the uh, financing that is needed for, let's say, this 210 billion euros of investment that needs to be done in the European Union uh, for uh, the next uh, decade or so. And, of course, a large part of that is for southeastern Europe and for the eastern uh, Mediterranean. The estimate uh, by the European Commission is... Uh, at about 60 billion uh, gap. That's, uh, let's say, about one-third of what uh, is necessary out of the uh, 210. So the, I guess the, the theme of the panel is, uh, okay, we, we, we know these uh, problems, uh, we have this gap, what is the solution, uh, what uh, can, uh, can be done to, to solve uh, these issues. And uh, in my mind, uh, there are several things that uh, have to come together if we are to achieve uh, the actual financing and construction of these uh, infrastructure projects. Uh, one thing that is uh, for sure uh, necessary is a higher participation of the private uh, sector in the financing of these infrastructure projects. If it cannot be the governments alone or, uh, let's say, the governments and uh, the traditional private sector uh, that is involved in uh, project uh, finance together with their banks, then uh, what has to happen is that uh, the financing has to open up to private financing, but not of the traditional type. And I'm going to come back to this a little bit later uh, when I talk a little bit about the project bond uh, initiative of the European Union and the uh, European Investment Bank. The second thing that for sure has to happen is better leverage of public funds. If public funds are necessary but they are scarce, then we have to find ways of leveraging these uh, public uh, funds uh, in a way uh, that covers a bigger uh, scale and a bigger scope. And, of course, leverage is just another word for saying use the public funds as a basis uh, to be able to uh, invite and include other sources, in particular private sources of financing, to achieve the totality uh, of the uh, financing. And then along the same uh, scheme, but uh, with uh, different players, is that uh, we have to find uh, ways of using the balance sheets of uh, international financial institutions, which uh, have proved to be very healthy and remained healthy uh, throughout uh, the crisis, uh, to leverage on these balance sheets to find financing uh, for uh, these uh, uh, investments. And, of course, in these international financial institutions, I, I think primarily of the European Investment Bank, but not only. Uh, the IFC of the World Bank and the EBRD in London also have mandates uh, in the region, in the southeastern uh, Europe and the eastern Mediterranean region, and they could also be uh, involved there. Now, the, the, thankfully, the European Union, and we heard a lot about that from uh, Mrs. Zavella earlier on, is thinking about this in the, in the framework of the uh, multi-annual uh, financial framework from 2014 to 2020, and seeing how they can leverage public funds, because, of course, also European community funds are public uh, funds, uh, to be able to attract uh, other sources of, uh, of investment. Very uh, important uh, instrument uh, in this uh, goal will be uh, the Connecting Europe facility that uh, Mrs. Javela also mentioned uh, briefly earlier. What the Connecting Europe facility uh, will do uh, throughout the multiannual financial framework is it will define projects of common interest uh, to which these uh, community funds uh, will be uh, uh, directed. The original proposal uh, from the uh, Commission was for uh, about 9 billion to go to such energy infrastructure. Uh, 
uh, after the most recent uh, negotiation, and you should remember that we're still <coughs> under negotiation of the, uh, at least between the, the Parliament and the Council, which of, with, of course, uh, the help of the Commission. Uh, this nine billion for energy infrastructure has gone down to five billion. So already this is not uh, a good uh, sign for, for what is needed. Now, the uh, con Connecting Europe facility uh, is going to uh, work uh, in different ways, uh, some traditional ways, which uh, have been uh, the way of grants. Uh, we give something because we want to make the project uh, commercially viable as a grant. That used to be the case very much in the past now with uh, the need being uh, bigger, but also the money available uh, in the community uh, being uh, smaller. Of course, the idea has uh, gone towards more not grants, uh, which have a very low leverage uh, factor, but different uh, forms of uh, leveraging. And this uh, brings uh, also the, um, uh, the implementation, which uh, hopefully uh, will, uh, will happen, of the project bond initiative. I'm not going to go through the project bond initiative now. I can uh, expand maybe on this uh, later, but I think uh, the majority of, uh, of, of the audience here uh, have heard of it uh, before. The idea of that is to use scarce public funds, to use the balance sheet of a strong IFI such as the uh, European Investment Bank, and attract funding from non-traditional private sources of uh, financing uh, project uh, finance. Again, I, I stress traditional, pri traditional private sources have been the banks and others who are uh, involved in, in energy uh, and uh, in construction. So to conclude, uh, what we will need, uh, to conclude my preliminary uh, remarks, what we will need is uh, tighter cooperation between uh, the state and in general the public sector, uh, the banking uh, and the more general private uh, sector, and of course also uh, of IFIs uh, such as the EIB but not uh, only. Thank you. Uh, before I open the floor to questions, I have two of them for the panel. First of all, to Mr. Patridge, you made the generic point about um, <clears throat> changing rules. Do you have specific cases when you were faced with a situation where, although you felt on the investment level you could go ahead, you did not because of the changing rules because of Russia? No, I, um, I think that I'll give you uh, a positive example, um, and um, which is that of a, a project that we recently closed, uh, which is a, a road, a ring road in uh, St. Petersburg. Uh, that was a, a difficult project because it's a big investment. Uh, the, uh, the, uh, the, the private part is uh, some uh, $4 billion. Um, uh, it, is, it is a complex road that goes on tunnels and, 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 and bridges. Uh, and it took a lot of elements to make the project feasible. There was a first attempt uh, that was arranged by a, a consortium of excellent companies, uh, European companies, uh, Bouygues, Octave, Strabag, and others. And uh, the first, uh, they were selected and uh, but they were unable to put together the project and the financing. Uh, then uh, a couple of years later, the project was re uh, rejigged by the uh, the city of Saint Petersburg, and this time it was successful. So what was the difference? Why did it work the second time? It didn't work the first time. <laughs> uh, the first time uh, it was very ambitious. Uh, it was uh, it covered the whole the, the whole section and therefore it was something like uh, 10, 10 billion or almost 10 billion euros. Um, it was uh, and there were a lot of uncertainties. There were uncertainties as to uh, who was taking what risk, how the risk were allocated between the city and the consortium. Uh, there were a lot of uh, uncertainties with regard to the uh, to the construction because uh, no, nobody knew exactly what the ground was going to be. 
Um, so the cost of the runs were, were, uh, were there. There was uncertainty on the revenues of the project. It's a toll road, the first toll road in Russia. Um, and uh, and uh, therefore, it was too much, uh, too much risk, too un undetermined. So the city uh, uh, did several things. Uh, they, um, they strengthened the local legislation on PPPs uh, to, uh, to make the responsibilities of the city vis-a-vis -vis the, uh, the concessionaire clearer. Um, they reduced the scope of the project by having an allocation. They, have, they, they, they built the relatively easy part of the road on their, on their, uh, uh, separately on the, on the budget, and they tendered the difficult uh, segment in, in the center, but it allowed a more narrowly defined project, clearer, simpler to understand. And uh, there was, uh, the tender was based on two criteria. Uh, what was the... Uh, uh, the minimum revenue guarantee that was required from the city and what was the upside that was shared with the, with the, with the city. And that allowed a, a, a system where it was clear and the risks that were taken by the concessionaire were defined by the very rules of the, of the tender. A consortium was formed of which uh, actually uh, we as a bank decided that uh, we would even enter as, a, as, a, as an equity participant. Um, uh, and was able to, uh, to, uh, to, to build this. We're working with uh, Italian and uh, Turkish contractors. Um, and the road is going ahead. The financing was arranged, and uh, there was a good allocation of the risk. So the, the key was to have very clearly defined allocation of risk, goals, uh, revenue, uh, and understand clearly what uh, how it works. Thank you. And to... Dr. Jalad, because these days in Greece, <clears throat> there's a lot of interest about possible Arab interest in Greece. There's a lot of talk about Qatar, not confined to Qatar. Given your experience, can you share some thoughts on that? Is there true interest from Arab investors? Is it not? And if it is, do you have an analysis of it? Look, uh Money does not know any nationality, and you know that. So, if the environment is good, they will come. If the environment is not good, the business environment, they, they may not come. They will go somewhere else. It's very simple. Even, even the Greeks left this country with their billions of dollars. You want others to come in? Where is, what, what is this? Uh, you must face the facts. You must face reality. All right. So it is very, very simple. There's no need for Aristotle or Socrates to come and explain to you these things. You know it at home. Your child knows that. Okay? This is one. Because there are impediments to financing not necessarily related to any nation or to any culture. And I will give you... because. I will give you some traits. Why infrastructure? We're talking about infrastructure. But if I'm talking about a casino, it's a different thing. All right? The infrastructure, the commonality among infrastructure is that they are huge. One. Therefore, difficult to finance. They are uh, uh, interdependent. That adds to their difficulty. They are uh, 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 sensitive to elections. They are sensitive, okay? If you look at the history of how infrastructure was built here and until yesterday, you don't see this kind of coordination that has society as its final uh, 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 beneficiary. All right? You have Syriza here, and you have I don't know what, and all these things. Why? Infrastructure in any country, and probably globally, enhances the human rights of their citizens. Without infrastructure, how can you have good education? How can you have good access to water? How can you have, and so on. 
all the, how can you have gainful jobs? These are all uh, human rights. We don't want to have human rights in uh, somewhere outside Greece. I want to see, first of all, human rights here. This is why infrastructure is a vital issue to this country. And it will enhance its, its actual position worldwide. Thank you. I don't know if I have, but this is my, my right. Well, my, my question was a little bit more uh, generic in general. I mean, this talk here in Greece, we analyze, we talk a lot about Arab interests. They will buy this, they want to buy that. So I was just wondering, given your experience, yes, of course. is there some truth to it? Or do we tend to exaggerate as we do a lot of times? No, no. I just, just a point. Just, yeah, you are. No, no. What I'm trying to say is that, yes, there is genuine interest if there is genuine uh, 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 supply of good environment in business. Look, my friend, look at your bureaucracy. Look, if you go to Dubai, in 36 hours, you can have a company. Here, you want to have 36 years, maybe. <laughs> if, you have, if you have here, if you have... I'm running for the elections. <laughs> no. So if you have, for instance, please, I'm not joking really, but if you have such uh, 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 detrimental bureaucratic issues, then the banks will immediately know. They are very good. And investors are all covered. You are a covered investor. I am a covered investor. All right? So... Uh, uh, we look at things. Qatar is interested. UAE is interested. I am not talking as national, as people. They have a lot of money. Why should they go to Turkey? Why not here? Thank you. Thank you. Um, questions? Questions? How do they... Three, two, one, how do they, you have your last chance. Um, no one? We answered all the questions. All right. Thank you very much. And uh, we have a small break, and then we'll get back with the rest of the seminar. <laughs>